Chapter Six of A Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Six of A Little Princess: The Diamond Mines. Not very long after this, a very exciting thing happened. Not only Sarah, but the entire school found it exciting and made it the chief subject of conversation for weeks after it occurred. In one of his letters, Captain Crewe told a most interesting story. A friend, who had been at school with him when he was a boy, had unexpectedly come to see him in India. He was the owner of a large tract of land upon which diamonds had been found, and he was engaged in developing the mines. If all went as was confidently expected, he would become possessed of such wealth as it made one dizzy to think of, and because he was fond of the friend of his school days, he had given him an opportunity to share in this enormous fortune by becoming a partner in his scheme. This, at least, was what Sarah gathered from his letters. It is true that any other business scheme, however magnificent, would have had but small attraction for her or for the schoolroom, but diamond mines sounded so like the Arabian Nights that no one could be indifferent. Sarah thought them enchanting, and painted pictures for Ermengarde and Lottie of labyrinthine passages in the bowels of the earth, where sparkling stones studded the walls and roofs and ceilings, and strange dark men dug them out with heavy picks. Ermengarde delighted in the story, and Lottie insisted on its being retold to her every evening. Lavinia was very spiteful about it, and told Jessie that she didn't believe such things as diamond mines existed. "'My mamma has a diamond ring which cost forty pounds,' she said. "'And it is not a big one, either. If there were mines full of diamonds, people would be so rich it would be ridiculous.' "'Perhaps Sarah will be so rich that she will be ridiculous,' <laughs> giggled Jessie. "'She's ridiculous without being rich,' Lavinia sniffed. "'I believe you hate her.' said Jessie. "'No, I don't,' snapped Lavinia. "'But I don't believe in mines full of diamonds.' "'Well, people have to get them from somewhere,' said Jessie. "'Lavinia,' <laughs> with a new giggle, "'what do you think Gertrude says?' "'I don't know, I'm sure, and I don't care if it's something more about that everlasting Sarah.' "'Well, it is. One of her pretense is that she's a princess. She plays it all the time, even in school.' She says it makes her learn her lessons better. She wants Ermengarde to be one, too, but Ermengarde says she is too fat. She is too fat, said Lavinia. And Sarah is too thin. Naturally, Jessie giggled again. She says it has nothing to do with what you look like or what you have. It is only to do with what you think of and what you do. I suppose she thinks she could be a princess if she was a beggar, said Lavinia. Let us begin to call her Your Royal Highness. Lessons for the day were over, and they were sitting before the schoolroom fire, enjoying the time they liked best. It was the time when Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia were taking their tea in the sitting-room sacred to themselves. At this hour a great deal of talking was done, and a great many secrets changed hands, particularly if the younger pupils behaved themselves well, and did not squabble or run about noisily which it must be confessed they usually did. When they made an uproar, the older girls usually interfered with scoldings and shakes. They were expected to keep order, and there was danger that if they did not, Miss Minchin or Miss Amelia would appear and put an end to the festivities. Even as Lavinia spoke, the door opened and Sarah entered with Lottie, whose habit was to trot everywhere after her like a little dog. "'There she is with that horrid child!' exclaimed Lavinia in a whisper. If she's so fond of her, why doesn't she keep her in her own room? She will begin howling about something in five minutes. It happened that Lottie had been seized with a sudden desire to play in the schoolroom, and had begged her adopted parent to come with her. She joined a group of little ones who were playing in a corner. Sarah curled herself up in the window seat, opened a book, and began to read it. It was a book about the French Revolution, and she was soon lost in a harrowing picture of the prisoners in the Bastille men who had spent so many years in dungeons, that when they were dragged out by those who rescued them, their long gray hair and beards almost hid their faces, and they had forgotten that an outside world existed at all, and were like beings in a dream. 
she was so far away from the schoolroom that it was not agreeable to be dragged back suddenly by a howl from lottie never did she find anything so difficult as to keep herself from losing her temper when she was suddenly disturbed while absorbed in a book people who are fond of books know the feeling of irritation which sweeps over them at such a moment the temptation to be unreasonable and snappish is one not easy to manage it makes me feel as if some one had hit me sarah had told ermengarde once in confidence and as if i want to hit back i have to remember things quickly to keep from saying something ill-tempered she had to remember things quickly when she laid her book on the window-seat and jumped down from her comfortable corner lottie had been sliding across the schoolroom floor and having first irritated lavinia and jessie by making a noise had ended by falling down and hurting her fat knee she was screaming and dancing up and down in the midst of a group of friends and enemies who were alternately coaxing and scolding her stop it this minute you cry baby stop this minute lavinia commanded i'm not a cry baby i'm not wailed lottie sarah sarah if she doesn't stop miss minchin will hear her cried jessie lottie darling i'll give you a penny i don't want your penny sobbed lottie and she looked down at the fat knee and seeing a drop of blood on it burst forth again sarah flew across the room and kneeling down put her arms around her now lottie she said now lottie you promised sarah she said i was a cry-baby wept lottie sarah patted her but spoke in the steady voice lottie knew but if you cry you will be one lottie pet you promised lottie remembered that she had promised but she preferred to lift up her voice i haven't got any mamma she proclaimed i haven't a bit of mamma yes you have said sarah cheerfully have you forgotten don't you know that sarah is your mamma don't you want sarah for your mamma Lottie cuddled up to her with a consoled sniff. Come and sit in the window seat with me, Sarah went on, and I'll whisper a story to you. Will you? whimpered Lottie. Will you tell me about the diamond mines? The diamond mines? broke out Lavinia. Nasty little spoiled thing. I should like to slap her. Sarah got up quickly on her feet. It must be remembered that she had been very deeply absorbed in the book about the Bastille, and she had had to recall several things rapidly when she realized that she must go and take care of her adopted child she was not an angel and she was not fond of lavinia well she said with some fire i should like to slap you but i don't want to slap you restraining herself at least i both want to slap you and i should like to slap you but i won't slap you we are not little gutter children we are both old enough to know better here was lavinia's opportunity ah yes your royal highness she said we are princesses i believe at least one of us is the school ought to be very fashionable now miss minchin has a princess for a pupil sarah started toward her she looked as if she were going to box her ears perhaps she was her trick of pretending things was the joy of her life she never spoke of it to girls she was not fond of her new pretend about being a princess was very near to her heart, and she was shy and sensitive about it. She had meant it to be rather a secret, and here was Lavinia deriding it before nearly all the school. She felt the blood rush up into her face and tingle in her ears. She only just saved herself. If you were a princess, you did not fly into rages. Her hand dropped, and she stood quite still a moment. When she spoke, it was in a quiet, steady voice. She held her head up, and everybody listened to her. It is true, she said. Sometimes I do pretend I am a princess. I pretend I am a princess so that I can try and behave like one. Lavinia could not think of exactly the right thing to say. Several times she had found that she could not think of a satisfactory reply when she was dealing with Sarah. The reason of this was that somehow— the rest always seemed to be vaguely in sympathy with her opponent she saw now that they were pricking up their ears interestedly the truth was they liked princesses and they all hoped they might hear something more definite about this one and drew nearer sarah accordingly lavinia could only invent one remark and it fell rather flat dear me she said i hope when you ascend the throne you won't forget us i won't 
said Sarah, and she did not utter another word, but stood quite still, and stared at her steadily as she saw her take Jessie's arm and turn away. After this, the girls who were jealous of her used to speak of her as Princess Sarah whenever they wished to be particularly disdainful, and those who were fond of her gave her the name among themselves as a term of affection. No one called her Princess instead of Sarah, but her adorers were much pleased with the picturesqueness and grandeur of the title, and Miss Minchin, hearing of it, mentioned it more than once to visiting parents, feeling that it rather suggested a sort of royal boarding-school. To Becky it seemed the most appropriate thing in the world. The acquaintance begun on the foggy afternoon when she had jumped up terrified from her sleep in the comfortable chair, had ripened and grown, though it must be confessed that Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia knew very little about it. They were aware that Sarah was kind to the scullery maid, but they knew nothing of certain delightful moments snatched perilously when, the upstairs room being set in order with lightning rapidity, Sarah's sitting-room was reached, and the heavy coal-box set down with a sigh of joy. At such times stories were told by installments. Things of a satisfying nature were either produced and eaten, or hastily tucked into pockets to be disposed of at night, when Becky went upstairs to her attic to bed. "'But I has to eat him careful, miss,' she said once. "'Cause if I leaves crumbs, the rats come out to get em. "'Rats!' exclaimed Sarah in horror. "'Are there rats here?' "'Lots of em, miss,' Becky answered in quite a matter-of-fact manner. "'There mostly is rats and mice in attics. "'You gets used to the noise they make, scuttling about. "'I've got so I don't mind em, so long as they don't run over my pillar.' "'Ugh!' said Sarah. "'You gets used to anything after a bit,' said Becky. "'You have to, miss, if you're born a scullery maid. I'd rather have rats than cockroaches.' "'So would I,' said Sarah. "'I suppose you might make friends with a rat in time, but I don't believe I should like to make friends with a cockroach.' Sometimes Becky did not dare to spend more than a few minutes in the bright, warm room, and when this was the case perhaps only a few words could be exchanged and a small purchase slipped into the old-fashioned pocket Becky carried under her dress skirt, tied round her waist with a band of tape. The search for and discovery of satisfying things to eat which could be packed into small compass added a new interest to Sarah's existence. When she drove or walked out, she used to look into shop windows eagerly. The first time it occurred to her to bring home two or three little meat pies, she felt that she had hit upon a discovery. When she exhibited them, Becky's eyes quite sparkled. "'Oh, miss,' she murmured, "'them will be nice and fillin'. It's fillin'ness that's best. Sponge cake's a heavenly thing, but it melts away like, if you understand, miss. These'll just stay in your stomach.' "'Well,' hesitated Sarah, "'I don't think it would be good if they stayed always, but I do believe they will be satisfying.' They were satisfying, and so were beef sandwiches bought at a cook shop, and so were rolls and bologna sausage. In time Becky began to lose her hungry, tired feeling, and the coal box did not seem so unbearably heavy. However heavy it was, and whatsoever the temper of the cook, and the hardness of the work heaped upon her shoulders, she had always the chance of the afternoon to look forward to, the chance that Miss Sarah would be able to be in her sitting-room. In fact, the mere seeing of Miss Sarah would have been enough without meat pies. If there was time only for a few words, they were always friendly, merry words that put heart into one. And if there was time for more, then there was an installment of a story to be told, or some other thing one remembered afterward and sometimes lay awake in one's bed in the attic to think over. Sarah, who was only doing what she unconsciously liked better than anything else, nature having made her for a giver, had not the least idea what she meant to poor Becky, and how wonderful a benefactor she seemed. If nature has made you for a giver, your hands are born open, and so is your heart. And though there may be times when your hands are empty, your heart is always full, and you can give things out of fat. Warm things, kind things, sweet things, help and comfort and laughter, and sometimes gay, kind laughter is the best help of all. 
Becky had scarcely known what laughter was through all her poor, little, hard-driven life. Sarah made her laugh, and laughed with her, and though neither of them quite knew it, the laughter was as fillin' as the meat-pies. A few weeks before Sarah's eleventh birthday, a letter came to her from her father, which did not seem to be written in such boyish high spirits as usual. He was not very well, and was evidently overweighted by the business connected with the diamond mines. You see, little Sarah, he wrote, your daddy is not a business man at all, and figures and documents bother him. He does not really understand them, and all this seems so enormous. Perhaps, if I was not feverish, I should not be awake, tossing about one half of the night and spend the other half in troublesome dreams. If my little missus were here, I dare say she would give me some solemn good advice. You would, wouldn't you, little missus? One of his many jokes had been to call her his little missus because she had such an old-fashioned air. He had made wonderful preparations for her birthday. Among other things, a new doll had been ordered in Paris, and her wardrobe was to be, indeed, a marvel of splendid perfection. When she had replied to the letter asking her if the doll would be an acceptable present, Sarah had been very quaint. I am getting very old, she wrote. You see, I shall never live to have another doll given me. This will be my last doll. There is something solemn about it. If I could write poetry, I am sure a poem about a last doll would be very nice. But I cannot write poetry. I have tried, and it made me laugh. It did not sound like Watts or Coleridge or Shakespeare at all. No one could ever take Emily's place, but I should respect the last doll very much, and I am sure the school would love it. They all like dolls, though some of the big ones, the almost fifteen ones, pretend they are too grown up. Captain Crewe had a splitting headache when he read this letter in his bungalow in India. The table before him was heaped with papers and letters which were alarming him, and filling him with anxious dread, but he laughed as he had not laughed for weeks. <laughs> oh, he said. She's better fun every year she lives. God grant this business may right itself, and leave me free to run home and see her. What wouldn't I give to have her little arms around my neck this minute? What wouldn't I give? The birthday was to be celebrated by great festivities. The schoolroom was to be decorated, and there was to be a party. The boxes containing the presents were to be opened with great ceremony, and there was to be a glittering feast spread in Miss Minchin's sacred room. When the day arrived, the whole house was in a whirl of excitement. How the morning passed, nobody quite knew, because there seemed such preparations to be made. The schoolroom was being decked with garlands of holly, the desks had been moved away, and red covers had been put on the forms which were arrayed around the room against the wall. When Sarah went into her sitting-room in the morning, she found on the table a small, dumpy package, tied up in a piece of brown paper. She knew it was a present, and she thought she could guess whom it came from. She opened it quite tenderly. It was a square pincushion, made of not quite clean red flannel, and black pins had been stuck carefully into it to form the words, Many Happy Returns. Oh! cried Sarah, with a warm feeling in her heart. What pain she has taken! I like it so! It, it makes me feel sorrowful! But the next moment she was mystified. On the underside of the pincushion was secured a card, bearing in neat letters the name Miss Amelia Minchin. Sarah turned it over and over. Miss Amelia? she said to herself. How can it be? And just at that very moment she heard the door being cautiously pushed open and saw Becky peeping round it. There was an affectionate, happy grin on her face and she shuffled forward and stood nervously pulling at her fingers. "'Do yer like it, Miss Sarah?' she said. "'Do yer?' "'Like it?' cried Sarah. "'You darling Becky, you made it all yourself!' Becky gave a hysteric but joyful sniff, and her eyes looked quite moist with delight. <laughs> "'It ain't nothing but flannin, and the flannin ain't new, but I wanted to give yer something, and I made it of nights.' I knew yer could pretend it was satin, with diamond pins in. I tried to when I was making it. The card, miss, it weren't wrong of me to pick it up out of the dustpin, was it? Miss Millier had throwed it away. I hadn't no card of my own, and I knowed it wouldn't be a proper present if I didn't pin a card on. 
so I pinned Miss Millier's. Sarah flew at her and hugged her. She could not have told herself or anyone else why there was a lump in her throat. Oh, Becky! She cried out with a queer little laugh. I love you, Becky. I do, I do. Oh, Miss! Breathed Becky. Thank your Miss kindly. It ain't good enough for that. The... The flannin wasn't new. End of chapter 6「The Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 of A Little Princess The Diamond Mines Again. When Sarah entered the holly hung schoolroom in the afternoon, she did so as the head of a sort of procession. Miss Minchin, in her grandest silk dress, led her by the hand. A manservant followed, carrying the box containing the last doll. A housemaid carried a second box, and Becky brought up the rear, carrying a third and wearing a clean apron and a new cap. Sarah would have much preferred to enter in the usual way, but Miss Minchin had sent for her and, after an interview in her private sitting-room, had expressed her wishes. "'This is not an ordinary occasion.' she said i do not desire that it should be treated as one so sarah was led grandly in and felt shy when on her entry the big girls stared at her and touched each other's elbows and the little ones began to squirm joyously in their seats silence young ladies said miss minchin at the murmur which arose james place the box on the table and remove the lid emma put yours upon a chair becky suddenly and severely becky had quite forgotten herself in her excitement and was grinning at Lottie, who was wriggling with rapturous expectation. She almost dropped her box, the disapproving voice so startled her, and her frightened, bobbing curtsy of apology was so funny that Lavinia and Jessie tittered. "'It is not your place to look at the young ladies,' said Miss Minchin. "'You forget yourself. Put your box down.' Becky obeyed with alarmed haste, and hastily backed toward the door. "'You may leave us.' Miss Minchin announced to the servants with a wave of her hand. Becky stepped aside respectfully to allow the superior servants to pass out first. She could not help casting a longing glance at the box on the table. Something made of blue satin was peeping from beneath the folds of tissue paper. "'If you please, Miss Minchin,' said Sarah suddenly, "'mayn't Becky stay?' It was a bold thing to do. Miss Minchin was betrayed into something like a slight jump. Then she put her eyeglass up and gazed at her show pupil disturbedly. Becky! she exclaimed. My dearest Sarah! Sarah advanced a step toward her. I want her because I know she will like to see the presents, she explained. She is a little girl, too, you know. Miss Minchin was scandalized. She glanced from one figure to the other. My dear Sarah, she said, Becky is the scullery maid. Scullery maids, er... Uh, are not little girls. It really had not occurred to her to think of them in that light. Scullery maids were machines who carried coal scuttles and made fires. But Becky is, said Sarah, and I know she would enjoy herself. Please let her stay, because it is my birthday. Miss Minchin replied with much dignity. As you ask it as a birthday favor, she may stay. Rebecca, thank Miss Sarah for her great kindness. Becky had been backing into the corner, twisting the hem of her apron in delighted suspense. She came forward, bobbing courtesies, but between Sarah's eyes and her own there passed a gleam of friendly understanding, while her words tumbled over each other. "'Oh, if you please, miss! I'm that grateful, miss! I did want to see the doll, miss, that I did! Thank you, miss! And thank you, ma'am!' turning and making an alarmed bob to Miss Minchin, "'for letting me take the liberty!' Miss Minchin waved her hand again. This time it was in the direction of the corner near the door. "'Go and stand there,' she commanded. "'Not too near the young ladies.' Becky went to her place, grinning. She did not care where she was sent, so that she might have the luck of being inside the room, instead of being downstairs in the scullery, while these delights were going on. She did not even mind when Miss Minchin cleared her throat ominously and spoke again. "'Now, young ladies, I have a few words to say to you,' she announced. 
She's going to make a speech, whispered one of the girls. I wish it was over. Sarah felt rather uncomfortable. As this was her party, it was probable that the speech was about her. It is not agreeable to stand in a schoolroom and have a speech made about you. You are aware, young ladies, the speech began, for it was a speech. That dear Sarah is eleven years old today. Dear Sarah, murmured Lavinia. Several of you here have also been eleven years old, but Sarah's birthdays are rather different from other little girls' birthdays. When she is older, she will be heiress to a large fortune, which it will be her duty to spend in a meritorious manner. The diamond mines, <laughs> giggled Jessie in a whisper. Sarah did not hear her, but as she stood with her green-gray eyes fixed steadily on Miss Minchin, she felt herself growing rather hot. When Miss Minchin talked about money, she felt somehow that she always hated her, and, of course, it was disrespectful to hate grown-up people. When her dear papa, Captain Crewe, brought her from India and gave her into my care, the speech proceeded, he said to me in a jesting way, I am afraid she will be very rich, Miss Minchin. My reply was, Her education at my seminary, Captain Crewe, shall be such as will adorn the largest fortune. Sarah has become my most accomplished pupil. Her French and her dancing are a credit to the seminary. Her manners, which have caused you to call her Princess Sarah, are perfect. Her amiability she exhibits by giving you this afternoon's party. I hope you appreciate her generosity. I wish you to express your appreciation of it by saying aloud all together, Thank you, Sarah. The entire schoolroom rose to its feet as it had done the morning Sarah remembered so well. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Sarah! It said, and it must be confessed that Lottie jumped up and down. Sarah looked rather shy for a moment. She made a courtesy, and it was a very nice one. Thank you, she said, for coming to my party. Very pretty indeed, Sarah approved Miss Minchin. That is what a real princess does when the populace applauds her. Lavinia, scathingly, the sound you just made was extremely like a snort. If you are jealous of your fellow pupil, I beg you will express your feelings in some more ladylike manner. Now I will leave you to enjoy yourselves. The instant she had swept out of the room, the spell her presence always had upon them was broken. The door had scarcely closed before every seat was empty. The little girls jumped or tumbled out of theirs. The older ones wasted no time in deserting theirs. There was a rush toward the boxes. Sarah had bent over one of them with a delighted face. These are books, I know, she said. The little children broke into a rueful murmur, and Ermengarde looked aghast. Does your papa send you books for a birthday present? she exclaimed. Why, he's as bad as mine. Don't open them, Sarah. I like them. Sarah laughed, but she turned to the biggest box. When she took out the last doll, it was so magnificent that the children uttered delighted groans of joy, and actually drew back to gaze at it in breathless rapture. She's almost as big as Lottie! Someone gasped. Lottie clapped her hands and danced about, giggling. She's dressed for the theatre, said Lavinia. Her cloak is lined with ermine. Oh! cried Ermengarde, darting forward. She has an opera glass in her hand, a blue and gold one. Here is her trunk, said Sarah. Let's open it and look at her things. She sat down upon the floor and turned the key. The children crowded, clamoring around her, as she lifted tray after tray and revealed their contents. Never had the schoolroom been in such an uproar. There were lace collars and silk stockings and handkerchiefs, there was a jewel case containing a necklace and a tiara which looked quite as if they were made of real diamonds. There was a long sealskin and muff. There were ball dresses and walking dresses and visiting dresses. There were hats and tea gowns and fans. Even Lavinia and Jessie forgot that they were too elderly to care for dolls and uttered exclamations of delight and caught up things to look at them. Suppose, Sarah said as she stood by the table, putting a large, black velvet hat on the impassively smiling owner of all these splendors. Suppose she understands human talk and feels proud of being admired. You are always supposing things, said Lavinia, and her air was very superior. I know I am, 
answered Sarah, undisturbedly. I like it. There's nothing so nice as supposing. It's almost like being a fairy. If you suppose anything hard enough, it seems as if it were real. It's all very well to suppose things if you have everything, said Lavinia. Could you suppose and pretend if you were a beggar and lived in a garret? Sarah stopped arranging the last doll's ostrich plumes and looked thoughtful. I believe I could, she said. If one was a beggar, one would have to suppose and pretend all the time. But it mightn't be easy. She often thought afterward how strange it was that just as she had finished saying this, just at that very moment, Miss Amelia came into the room. Sarah, she said, your papa's solicitor, Mr. Barrow, is called to see Miss Minchin, and as she must talk to him alone, and the refreshments are laid in her parlour, you had all better come and have your feast now, so that my sister can have her interview here in the schoolroom. Refreshments were not likely to be disdained at any hour, and many pairs of eyes gleamed. Miss Amelia arranged the procession into decorum, and then, with Sarah at her side heading it, she led it away, leaving the last doll sitting upon a chair with the glories of her wardrobe scattered about her, dresses and coats hung upon chair-backs, piles of lace-frilled petticoats lying upon their seats. Becky, who was not expected to partake of refreshments, had the indiscretion to linger a moment to look at these beauties. It really was an indiscretion. "'Go back to your work, Becky,' Miss Amelia had said, but she had stopped to reverently pick up first a muff and then a coat, and while she stood looking at them adoringly, she heard Miss Minchin upon the threshold, and, being smitten with terror at the thought of being accused of taking liberties, she rashly darted under the table, which hid her by its tablecloth. Miss Minchin came into the room, accompanied by a sharp-featured, dry little gentleman, who looked rather disturbed. Miss Minchin herself also looked rather disturbed, it must be admitted, and she gazed at the dry little gentleman with an irritated and puzzled expression. She sat down with stiff dignity and waved him to a chair. "'Pray be seated, Mr. Barrow,' she said. Mr. Barrow did not sit down at once. His attention seemed attracted by the last doll and the things which surrounded her. He settled his eyeglasses and looked at them in nervous disapproval. The last doll herself did not seem to mind this in the least. She merely sat upright and returned his gaze indifferently. A hundred pounds, Mr. Barrow remarked succinctly. All expensive material, and made as a Parisian modiste's. He spent money lavishly enough, that young man. Miss Minchin felt offended. This seemed to be a disparagement of her best patron and was a liberty. Even solicitors had no right to take liberties. "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Barrow,' she said stiffly. "'I do not understand.' "'Birthday presents,' said Mr. Barrow in the same critical manner. "'To a child eleven years old. Mad extravagance, I call it.' Miss Minchin drew herself up still more rigidly. "'Captain Crewe is a man of fortune,' she said. "'The diamond mines alone.' Mr. Barrow wheeled round upon her. "'Diamond mines!' he broke out. "'There are none. Never were.' Miss Minchin actually got up from her chair. "'What?' she cried. "'What do you mean?' "'At any rate,' answered Mr. Barrow, quite snappishly. "'It would have been much better if there never had been any.' "'Any diamond mines?' ejaculated Miss Minchin, catching at the back of a chair and feeling as if a splendid dream was fading away from her. "'Diamond mines spell ruin oftener than they spell wealth,' said Mr. Barrow. "'When a man is in the hands of a very dear friend, and is not a business man himself, he had better steer clear of the dear friend's diamond mines, or gold mines, or any other kind of mines dear friends want his money to put into. The late Captain Crewe, here Miss Minchin stopped him with a gasp. "'The late, Captain Crewe!' she cried out. "'The late! You don't come to tell me that Captain Crewe is—' "'He's dead, ma'am. Mr. Barrow answered with jerky brusqueness. "'Died of jungle fever and business troubles combined. The jungle fever might not have killed him if he had not been driven mad by the business troubles. And the business troubles might not have put an end to him if the jungle fever had not assisted. Captain Crewe is dead.' 
Miss Minchin dropped into her chair again. The words he had spoken filled her with alarm. "'What were his business troubles?' she said. "'What were they?' "'Diamond mines,' answered Mr. Barrow. "'And dear friends, and ruin.' Miss Minchin lost her breath. "'Ruin?' she gasped out. "'Lost every penny. That young man had too much money. The dear friend was mad on the subject of the diamond mine. He put all his own money into it, and all Captain Crewe's. Then the dear friend ran away. Captain Crewe was already stricken with fever when the news came. The shock was too much for him. He died delirious, raving about his little girl, and didn't leave a penny. Now Miss Minchin understood, and never had she received such a blow in her life. Her show pupil, her show patron, swept away from the select seminary at one blow. She felt as if she had been outraged and robbed, and that Captain Crewe and Sarah and Mr. Barrow were equally to blame. "'Do you mean to tell me,' she cried out, "'that he left nothing? That Sarah will have no fortune? That the child is a beggar? That she is left on my hands a little pauper instead of an heiress?' Mr. Barrow was a shrewd business man, and felt it as well to make his own freedom from responsibility quite clear without any delay. "'She is certainly left a beggar,' he replied. "'And she is certainly left on your hands, ma'am, as she hasn't a relation in the world that we know of.' Miss Minchin started forward. She looked as if she was going to open the door and rush out of the room to stop the festivities going on joyfully, and rather noisily, that moment over the refreshments. "'It is monstrous,' she said. "'She's in my sitting-room at this moment, dressed in silk gauze and lace petticoats, giving a party at my expense.' "'She's giving it at your expense, madam, if she's giving it,' said Mr. Barrow calmly. "'Barrow and Skipworth are not responsible for anything. There never was a cleaner sweep made of a man's fortune. Captain Crewe died without paying our last bill.' and it was a big one miss minchin turned back from the door in increased indignation this was worse than any one could have dreamed of its being that is what has happened to me she cried i was always so sure of his payments that i went to all sorts of ridiculous expenses for the child i paid the bills for that ridiculous doll and her ridiculous fantastic wardrobe the child was to have anything she wanted she has a carriage and a pony and a maid and I've paid for all of them since the last check came. Mr. Barrow evidently did not intend to remain to listen to the story of Miss Minchin's grievances after he had made the position of his firm clear and related the mere dry facts. He did not feel any particular sympathy for irate keepers of boarding schools. You had better not pay for anything more, ma'am, he remarked, unless you want to make presents to the young lady. No one will remember you. She hasn't a brass farthing to call her own. But what am I to do? demanded Miss Minchin, as if she felt it entirely his duty to make the matter right. What am I to do? There isn't anything to do, said Mr. Barrow, folding up his eyeglasses and slipping them into his pocket. Captain Crewe is dead. The child is left a pauper. Nobody is responsible for her but you. I am not responsible for her, and I refuse to be made responsible. Miss Minchin became quite white with rage. Mr. Barrow turned to go. "'I have nothing to do with that, madam,' he said uninterestedly. "'Barrow and Skipworth are not responsible. Very sorry the thing has happened, of course.' "'If you think she is to be foisted off on me, you are greatly mistaken,' Miss Minchin gasped. "'I have been robbed and cheated. I will turn her into the street.' "'If she had not been so furious—' she would have been too discreet to say quite so much she saw herself burdened with an extravagantly brought-up child whom she had always resented and she lost all self-control mr barrow undisturbedly moved toward the door i wouldn't do that madam he commented it wouldn't look well unpleasant story to get about in connection with the establishment pupil bundled out penniless and without friends he was a clever business man, and he knew what he was saying. He also knew that Miss Minchin was a business woman, and would be shrewd enough to see the truth. She could not afford to do a thing which would make people speak of her as cruel and hard-hearted. Better keep her, 
and make use of her. He added, She's a clever child, I believe. You can get a good deal out of her as she grows older. I will get a good deal out of her before she grows older, exclaimed Miss Minchin. I am sure you will, ma'am, said Mr. Barrow, with a little sinister smile. I am sure you will. Good morning. He bowed himself out and closed the door, and it must be confessed that Miss Minchin stood for a few moments and glared at it. What he had said was quite true. She knew it. She had absolutely no redress. Her show pupil had melted into nothingness, leaving only a friendless, beggared little girl. Such money as she herself had advanced was lost and could not be regained. And as she stood there breathless under her sense of injury, there fell upon her ears a burst of gay voices from her own sacred room, which had actually been given up to the feast. She could at least stop this. But as she started toward the door it was opened by Miss Amelia, who, when she caught sight of the changed, angry face, fell back a step in alarm. "'What is the matter, sister?' she ejaculated. Miss Minchin's voice was almost as fierce when she answered, "'Where is Sarah Crewe?' Miss Amelia was bewildered. "'Sarah?' she stammered. "'Why, she's with the children in your room, of course.' "'Has she a black frock in her sumptuous wardrobe?' "'In bitter irony.' "'A, a black frock?' Miss Amelia stammered again. "'A black one?' "'She has frocks of every other colour. "'Has she a black one?' Miss Amelia began to turn pale. "'No, yes,' she said. "'But it is too short for her. "'She has only the old black velvet, and she has outgrown it.' "'Go and tell her to take off that preposterous pink silk gauze "'and put the black one on, whether it is too short or not. "'She has done with finery.' "'Then Miss Amelia began to wring her fat hands and cry. "'Oh, sister!' she sniffed. "'Oh, sister, what can have happened?' "'Miss Minchin wasted no words. "'Captain Crewe is dead,' she said. He has died without a penny. That spoiled, pampered, fanciful child is left a pauper on my hands. Miss Amelia sat down quite heavily in the nearest chair. Hundreds of pounds I have spent on nonsense for her, and I shall never see a penny of it. Put a stop to this ridiculous party of hers. Go and make her change her frock at once. I, panted Miss Amelia, M must I go and tell her now? This moment was the fierce answer. "'Don't sit staring like a goose. Go!' Poor Miss Amelia was accustomed to being called a goose. She knew, in fact, that she was rather a goose, and that it was left to geese to do a great many disagreeable things. It was a somewhat embarrassing thing to go into the midst of a room full of delighted children, and tell the giver of the feast that she had suddenly been transformed into a little beggar and must go upstairs and put on an old black frock, which was too small for her. But the thing must be done. This was evidently not the time when questions might be asked. She rubbed her eyes with her handkerchief until they looked quite red, after which she got up and went out of the room, without venturing to say another word. When her older sister looked and spoke as she had done just now, the wisest course to pursue was to obey orders without any comment. Miss Minchin walked across the room. She spoke to herself aloud without knowing that she was doing it. During the last year the story of the diamond mines had suggested all sorts of possibilities to her. Even proprietors of seminaries might make fortunes in stocks, with the aid of owners of mines. And now, instead of looking forward to gains, she was left to look back upon losses. "'The Princess Sarah, indeed,' she said. "'The child has been pampered as if she were a queen.' She was sweeping angrily past the corner table as she said it, and the next moment she started at the sound of a loud, sobbing sniff which issued from under the cover. "'What is that?' she exclaimed angrily. The loud, sobbing sniff was heard again, and she stooped and raised the hanging folds of the table cover. "'How dare you!' she cried out. "'How dare you! Come out immediately!' It was poor Becky who crawled out, and her cap was knocked on one side, and her face was red with repressed crying. 
"'If you please, Mum, it's me, Mum,' she explained. "'I know I hadn't ought to, but I was looking at the doll, Mum, and I was frightened when you come in, and I slipped under the table.' "'You have been there all the time, listening,' said Miss Minchin. "'No, Mum,' Becky protested, bobbing courtesies. "'Not listening. I thought I could slip out without your noticing, but I couldn't, and I had to stay. But I didn't listen, Mum. I wouldn't for nothing. But I couldn't help hearing.' Suddenly it seemed almost as if she lost all fear of the awful lady before her. She burst into fresh tears. "'Oh, please, um, she said. "'I dare say you'll give me a warning, Mum, but I'm so sorry for poor Miss Sarah. I'm so sorry.' "'Leave the room,' ordered Miss Minchin. Becky curtsied again, the tears openly streaming down her cheeks. "'Yes, um, I will, um, she said, trembling. "'But, oh, I just wanted to ask you. Miss Sarah, she's been such a rich young lady, and she's been waited on, hand and foot. And what will she do now, Mum, without no maid? If, if, oh, please, would you let me wait on her after I've done my pots and kettles? I'd do em that quick if you'd let me wait on her now she's poor. Oh! Breaking out afresh. Poor little Miss Sarah, Mum, that was called a princess. Somehow she made Miss Minchin feel more angry than ever, that the very scullery maid should range herself on the side of this child, whom she realized more fully than ever that she had never liked, was too much. She actually stamped her foot. No, certainly not, she said. She will wait on herself and on other people, too. Leave the room this instant, or you'll leave your place. Becky threw her apron over her head and fled. She ran out of the room and down the steps into the scullery, and there she sat down among her pots and kettles, and wept as if her heart would break. "'It's exactly like the ones in the stories,' she wailed. "'Them poor princess ones that was drove into the world!' Miss Minchin had never looked quite so still and hard as she did when Sarah came to her, a few hours later, in response to a message she had sent her. Even by that time it seemed to Sarah as if the birthday party had either been a dream or a thing which had happened years ago, and had happened in the life of quite another little girl. Every sign of the festivities had been swept away. The holly had been removed from the schoolroom walls, and the forms and desks put back into their places. Miss Minchin's sitting-room looked as it always did. All traces of the feast were gone, and Miss Minchin had resumed her usual dress. The pupils had been ordered to lay aside the party frocks, and this having been done, they had returned to the schoolroom and huddled together in groups, whispering and talking excitedly. "'Tell Sarah to come to my room,' Miss Minchin said to her sister, "'and explain to her clearly that I will have no crying or unpleasant scenes.' "'Sister,' replied Miss Amelia, "'she is the strangest child I ever saw. She has actually made no fuss at all. You remember she made none when Captain Crewe went back to India. When I told her what had happened, she just stood quite still and looked at me without making a sound. Her eyes seemed to get bigger and bigger, and she went quite pale. When I had finished, she still stood staring for a few seconds, and then her chin began to shake, and she turned round and ran out of the room and upstairs. Several of the other children began to cry, but she did not seem to hear them or to be alive to anything but just what I was saying. It made me feel quite queer not to be answered. And when you tell anything sudden and strange, you expect people will say, something, whatever it is. Nobody but Sarah herself ever knew what had happened in her room after she had run upstairs and locked her door. In fact, she herself scarcely remembered anything but that she walked up and down, saying over and over again to herself, in a voice which did not seem her own, "'My papa is dead! My papa is dead!' Once she stopped before Emily, who sat watching from her chair, and cried out wildly, "'Emily, do you hear? Do you hear? Papa is dead! He is dead in India, thousands of miles away!' When she came into Miss Minchin's sitting-room in answer to her summons, her face was white, and her eyes had dark rings around them. 
Her mouth was set as if she did not wish it to reveal what she had suffered and was suffering. She did not look in the least like the rose-colored butterfly child who had flown about from one of her treasures to the other in the decorated schoolroom. She looked instead a strange, desolate, almost grotesque little figure. She had put on, without Mariette's help, the cast-aside black velvet frock. It was too short and tight, and her slender legs looked long and thin, showing themselves from beneath the brief skirt. As she had not found a piece of black ribbon, her short, thick black hair tumbled loosely about her face and contrasted strongly with its pallor. She held Emily tightly in one arm, and Emily was swathed in a piece of black material. "'Put down your doll,' said Miss Minchin. "'What do you mean by bringing her here?' "'No,' Sarah answered. "'I will not put her down. She is all I have. My papa gave her to me.' She had always made Miss Minchin feel secretly uncomfortable, and she did so now. She did not speak with rudeness so much as with a cold steadiness with which Miss Minchin felt it difficult to cope perhaps because she knew she was doing a heartless and inhuman thing. "'You will have no time for dolls in future,' she said. "'You will have to work and improve yourself and make yourself useful.' Sarah kept her big, strange eyes fixed on her, and said not a word. "'Everything will be very different now,' Miss Minchin went on. "'I suppose Miss Amelia has explained matters to you?' "'Yes,' answered Sarah. "'My papa is dead. He left me no money.' I am quite poor. You are a beggar, said Miss Minchin, her temper rising at the recollection of what all this meant. It appears that you have no relations and no home and no one to take care of you. For a moment the thin, pale little face twitched, but Sarah again said nothing. What are you staring at? demanded Miss Minchin sharply. Are you so stupid that you cannot understand? I tell you that you are quite alone in the world, and have no one to do anything for you, unless I choose to keep you here out of charity. I understand, answered Sarah in a low tone, and there was a sound as if she had gulped down something which rose in her throat. I understand. That doll, cried Miss Minchin, pointing to the splendid birthday gift seated near. That ridiculous doll, with all her nonsensical, extravagant things, I actually paid the bill for her. Sarah turned her head toward the chair. The last doll, she said. The last doll. And her little mournful voice had an odd sound. The last doll indeed, said Miss Minchin. And she is mine, not yours. Everything you own is mine. Please take it away from me, then, said Sarah. I do not want it. If she had cried and sobbed and seemed frightened, Miss Minchin might almost have had more patience with her. She was a woman who liked to domineer and feel her power, and as she looked at Sarah's pale little steadfast face and heard her proud little voice, she quite felt as if her might was being set at naught. "'Don't put on grand airs,' she said. "'The time for that sort of thing is past. You are not a princess any longer. Your carriage and your pony will be sent away. Your maid will be dismissed.' You will wear your oldest and plainest clothes. Your extravagant ones are no longer suited to your station. You are like Becky. You must work for your living. To her surprise, a faint gleam of light came into the child's eyes. A shade of relief. Can I work? She said. If I can work, it will not matter so much. What can I do? You can do anything you are told, was the answer. You are a sharp child and pick up things readily. If you make yourself useful, I may let you stay here. You speak French well, and you can help with the younger children. May I? exclaimed Sarah. Oh, please let me. I know I can teach them. I like them, and they like me. Don't talk nonsense about people liking you, said Miss Minchin. You will have to do more than teach the little ones. You will run errands, and help in the kitchen as well as in the schoolroom. If you don't please me, you will be sent away. Remember that. Now go. Sarah stood still just a moment, looking at her. In her young soul she was thinking deep and strange things. Then she turned to leave the room. Stop, said Miss Minchin. Don't you intend to thank me? Sarah paused, and all the deep, strange thoughts surged up in her breast. What for? she said. For my kindness to you, replied Miss Minchin. 
for my kindness in giving you a home sarah made two or three steps toward her her thin little chest heaved up and down and she spoke in a strange unchildishly fierce way you are not kind she said you are not kind and this is not a home and she had turned and run out of the room before miss minchin could stop her or do anything but stare after her with stony anger she went up the stairs slowly but panting for breath and she held emily tightly against her side i wish she could talk she said to herself if she could speak if she could speak she meant to go to her room and lie down on the tiger skin with her cheek upon the great cat's head and look into the fire and think and think and think but just before she reached the landing miss amelia came out of the door and closed it behind her and stood before it looking nervous and awkward the truth was that she felt secretly ashamed of the thing she had been ordered to do you you were not to go in there she said not go in exclaimed sarah and she fell back a pace that is not your room now miss amelia answered reddening a little somehow all at once sarah understood she realized that this was the beginning of the change miss minchin had spoken of where is my room she asked hoping very much that her voice did not shake you are to sleep in the attic next to becky sarah knew where it was becky had told her about it she turned and mounted up two flights of stairs the last one was narrow and covered with shabby strips of old carpet she felt as if she were walking away and leaving far behind her the world in which that other child who no longer seemed herself had lived this child in her short tight old frock climbing the stairs to the attic was quite a different creature when she reached the attic door and opened it her heart gave a dreary little thump then she shut the door and stood against it and looked about her yes this was another world the room had a slanting roof and was whitewashed the whitewash was dingy and had fallen off in places there was a rusty grate an old iron bedstead and a hard bed covered with a faded coverlet some pieces of furniture too much worn to be used downstairs had been sent up under the skylight in the roof which showed nothing but an oblong piece of dull gray sky there stood an old battered red footstool sarah went to it and sat down she seldom cried she did not cry now she laid emily across her knees and put her face down upon her and her arms around her and sat there her little black head resting on the black draperies not saying one word not making one sound and as she sat in the silence there came a low tap at the door such a low humble one that she did not at first hear it and indeed was not roused until the door was timidly pushed open and a poor tear-smeared face appeared peeping round it it was becky's face and becky had been crying furtively for hours and rubbing her eyes with her kitchen apron until she looked strange indeed oh miss she said under her breath might i would you allow me just to come in sarah lifted her head and looked at her she tried to begin a smile and somehow she could not suddenly and it was all through the loving mournfulness of becky's streaming eyes her face looked more like a child's not so much too old for her years she held out her hand and gave a little sob oh becky she said i told you we were just the same only two little girls just two little girls you see how true it is there's no difference now i'm not a princess any more becky ran to her and caught her hand and hugged it to her breast kneeling beside her and sobbing with love and pain yes miss you are she cried and her words were all broken whatever happens to you whatever you'd be a princess all the same and nothing couldn't make you nothing different End of chapter 7《Little Princess》by Frances Hodgson Burnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 of A Little Princess in the Attic The first night she spent in her attic was a thing Sarah never forgot. During its passing, she lived through a wild, unchildlike woe, of which she never spoke to anyone about her. There was no one who would have understood. It was, indeed, well for her that as she lay awake in the darkness, her mind was forcibly distracted now and then by the strangeness of her surroundings. It was, perhaps, well for her that she was reminded by her small body of material things. If this had not been so, the anguish of her young mind might have been too great for a child to bear. But really, while the night was passing, she scarcely knew that she had a body at all, or remembered any other thing than one. My papa is dead, she kept whispering to herself. My papa is dead. It was not until long afterward that she realized that her bed had been so hard that she turned over and over in it to find a place to rest, that the darkness seemed more intense than any she had ever known, and that the wind howled over the roof among the chimneys like something which wailed aloud. Then there was something worse. This was certain scufflings and scratchings and squeakings in the walls and behind the skirting boards. She knew what they meant, because Becky had described them. They meant rats and mice who were either fighting with each other or playing together. Once or twice she even heard sharp-toed feet scurrying across the floor, and she remembered in those after days, when she recalled things, that when first she heard them she started up in bed and sat trembling, and when she lay down again covered her head with the bedclothes. The change in her life did not come about gradually, but was made all at once. She must begin as she is to go on, Miss Minchin said to Miss Amelia. She must be taught at once what she is to expect. Mariette had left the house the next morning. The glimpse Sarah caught of her sitting-room, as she passed its open door, showed her that everything had been changed. Her ornaments and luxuries had been removed, and a bed had been placed in a corner to transform it into a new pupil's bedroom. When she went down to breakfast she saw that her seat at Miss Minchin's side was occupied by Lavinia, and Miss Minchin spoke to her coldly. "'You will begin your new duties, Sarah,' she said, "'by taking your seat with the younger children at a smaller table. You must keep them quiet, and see that they behave well and do not waste their food. You ought to have been down earlier. Lottie has already upset her tea." That was the beginning, and from day to day the duties given to her were added to. She taught the younger children French and heard their other lessons, and these were the least of her labors. It was found that she could be made use of in numberless directions. She could be sent on errands at any time and in all weathers. She could be told to do things other people neglected. The cook and the housemaids took their tone from Miss Minchin, and rather enjoyed ordering about the young one, who had been made so much fuss over for so long. They were not servants of the best class, and had neither good manners nor good tempers, and it was frequently convenient to have at hand someone on whom blame could be laid. During the first month or two Sarah thought that her willingness to do things as well as she could and her silence under reproof, might soften those who drove her so hard. In her proud little heart she wanted them to see that she was trying to earn her living, and not accepting charity. But the time came when she saw that no one was softened at all, and the more willing she was to do as she was told, the more domineering and exacting careless housemates became, and the more ready a scolding cook was to blame her. If she had been older, Miss Minchin would have given her the bigger girls to teach, and saved money by dismissing an instructress. But while she remained and looked like a child, she could be made more useful as a sort of little superior errand girl and maid of all work. An ordinary errand boy would not have been so clever and reliable. Sarah could be trusted with difficult commissions and complicated messages. She could even go and pay bills and she combined with this the ability to dust a room well and to set things in order. Her own lessons became things of the past. She was taught nothing, and only after long and busy days spent in running here and there at everybody's orders, 
was she grudgingly allowed to go into the deserted schoolroom with a pile of old books and study alone at night if i do not remind myself of the things i have learned perhaps i may forget them she said to herself i am almost a scullery maid and if i am a scullery maid who knows nothing i shall be like poor becky i wonder if i could quite forget and begin to drop my h's and not remember that henry the eighth had six wives one of the most curious things in her new existence was her changed position among the pupils instead of being a sort of small royal personage among them she no longer seemed to be one of their number at all she was kept so constantly at work that she scarcely ever had an opportunity of speaking to any of them and she could not avoid seeing that miss minchin preferred that she should live a life apart from that of the occupants of the schoolroom i will not have her forming intimacies and talking to the other children that lady said girls like a grievance and if she begins to tell romantic stories about herself she will become an ill-used heroine and parents will be given a wrong impression it is better that she should live a separate life one suited to her circumstances i am giving her a home and that is more than she has any right to expect from me sarah did not expect much and was far too proud to try to continue to be intimate with girls who evidently felt rather awkward and uncertain about her the fact was that miss minchin's pupils were a set of dull matter-of-fact young people they were accustomed to being rich and comfortable and as sarah's frocks grew shorter and shabbier and queerer looking and it became an established fact that she wore shoes with holes in them and was sent out to buy groceries and carry them through the streets in a basket on her arm when the cook wanted them in a hurry they felt rather as if when they spoke to her they were addressing an under-servant to think that she was the girl with the diamond mines lavinia commented she does look like an object and she's queerer than ever i never liked her much but i can't bear that way she has now of looking at people without speaking just as if she was finding them out i am said sarah promptly when she heard of this that's what i look at some people for i like to know about them i think about them over afterward the truth was that she had saved herself annoyance several times by keeping her eye on lavinia who was quite ready to make mischief and who would have been rather pleased to have made it for the ex show pupil sarah never made any mischief herself or interfered with any one she worked like a drudge she tramped through the wet streets carrying parcels and baskets she labored with the childish inattention of the little ones as french lessons as she became shabbier and more forlorn-looking she was told that she had better take her meals downstairs she was treated as if she was nobody's concern and her heart grew proud and sore but she never told any one what she felt soldiers don't complain she would say between her small shut teeth i am not going to do it i will pretend this is part of a war but there were hours when her child heart might almost have broken with loneliness but for three people the first it must be owned was becky just becky throughout all that first night spent in the garret she had felt a vague comfort in knowing that on the other side of the wall in which the rats scuffled and squeaked there was another young human creature and during the nights that followed the sense of comfort grew they had little chance to speak to each other during the day each had her own tasks to perform and any attempt at conversation would have been regarded as a tendency to loiter and lose time don't mind me miss becky whispered during the first morning if i don't say nothing polite some un be down on us if i did i means please and thank you and beg pardon but i dasn't take time to say it but before daybreak she used to slip into sarah's attic and button her dress and give her such help as she required before she went downstairs to light the kitchen fire and when night came sarah always heard the humble knock at her door which meant that her handmaid was ready to help her again if she was needed during the first weeks of her grief sarah felt as if she were too stupefied to talk so it happened that some time passed before they saw each other much or exchanged visits becky's heart told her that it was best that people in trouble should be left alone the second of the trio of comforters was ermengarde but odd things happened before ermengarde found her place when sarah's mind seemed to awaken again to the life about her 
she realized that she had forgotten that an Ermengarde lived in the world. The two had always been friends, but Sarah had felt as if she were years the older. It could not be contested that Ermengarde was as dull as she was affectionate. She clung to Sarah in a simple, helpless way. She brought her lessons to her that she might be helped. She listened to every word and besieged her with requests for stories. But she had nothing interesting to say herself, and she loathed books of every description. She was, in fact, not a person one would remember when one was caught in the storm of a great trouble, and Sarah forgot her. It had been all the easier to forget her because she had been suddenly called home for a few weeks. When she came back she did not see Sarah for a day or two, and when she met her for the first time she encountered her coming down a corridor with her arms full of garments which were to be taken downstairs to be mended. Sarah herself had already been taught to mend them. She looked pale and unlike herself, and she was attired in the queer, outgrown frock whose shortness showed too much thin black leg. Ermengarde was too slow a girl to be equal to such a situation. She could not think of anything to say. She knew what had happened, but somehow she had never imagined Sarah could look like this, so odd and poor and almost like a servant. It made her quite miserable, and she could do nothing but break into a short hysterical laugh and exclaim, aimlessly and as if without any meaning, Oh, Sarah, is that you? Yes, answered Sarah, and suddenly a strange thought passed through her mind and made her face flush. She held the pile of garments in her arms, and her chin rested upon the top of it to keep it steady. Something in the look of her straight-gazing eyes made Ermengarde lose her wits still more. She felt as if Sarah had changed into a new kind of girl, and she had never known her before. Perhaps it was because she had suddenly grown poor and had to mend things and work like Becky. Oh, she stammered. How, how are you? I don't know, Sarah replied. How are you? I'm, I'm quite well, said Ermengarde, overwhelmed with shyness. Then spasmodically she thought of something to say which seemed more intimate. Are you, are you very unhappy? She said in a rush. Then Sarah was guilty of an injustice. Just at that moment her torn heart swelled within her, and she felt that if any one was as stupid as that, one had better get away from her. What do you think? She said. Do you think I am very happy? And she marched past her without another word. In course of time she realized that if her wretchedness had not made her forget things, she would have known that poor dull Ermengarde was not to be blamed for her unready, awkward ways. She was always awkward and the more she felt, the more stupid she was given to being. But the sudden thought which had flashed upon her had made her oversensitive. She is like the others, she had thought. She does not really want to talk to me. She knows no one does. So for several weeks a barrier stood between them. When they met by chance, Sarah looked the other way, and Ermengarde felt too stiff and embarrassed to speak. Sometimes they nodded to each other in passing but there were times when they did not even exchange a greeting. If she would rather not talk to me, Sarah thought, I will keep out of her way. Miss Minchin makes that easy enough. Miss Minchin made it so easy that at last they scarcely saw each other at all. At that time it was noticed that Ermengarde was more stupid than ever, and that she looked listless and unhappy. She used to sit in the window seat, huddled in a heap, and stare out of the window without speaking. Once Jessie, who was passing, stopped to look at her curiously. "'What are you crying for, Ermengarde?' she asked. "'I'm not crying,' answered Ermengarde in a muffled, unsteady voice. "'You are,' said Jessie. "'A great big tear just rolled down the bridge of your nose, and dropped off at the end of it. And there goes another.' "'Well,' said Ermengarde, "'I'm miserable, and no one need interfere.' and she turned her plump back and took out her handkerchief and boldly hid her face in it. That night, when Sarah went to her attic, it was later than usual. She had been kept at work until after the hour at which the pupils went to bed, and after that she had gone to her lessons in the lonely schoolroom. When she reached the top of the stairs, she was surprised to see a glimmer of light coming from under the attic door. Nobody goes there but myself, she thought quickly. 
but some one has lighted a candle some one had indeed lighted a candle and it was not burning in the kitchen candlestick she was expected to use but in one of those belonging to the pupils bedrooms the some one was sitting upon the battered footstool and was dressed in her nightgown and wrapped up in a red shawl it was ermengarde ermengarde cried sarah she was so startled that she was almost frightened you will get into trouble ermengarde stumbled up from her footstool she shuffled across the attic in her bedroom slippers which were too large for her her eyes and nose were pink with crying i know i shall if i'm found out she said but i don't care i don't care a bit oh sarah please tell me what is the matter why don't you like me any more something in her voice made the familiar lump rise in sarah's throat it was so affectionate and simple so like the old ermengarde who had asked her to be best friends it sounded as if she had not meant what she had seemed to mean during these past weeks i do like you sarah answered i thought you see everything is different now i thought you were different ermengarde opened her wet eyes wide why it was you who were different she cried you didn't want to talk to me i didn't know what to do it was you who were different after i came back sarah thought a moment she saw she had made a mistake i am different she explained though not in the way you think miss minchin does not want me to talk to the girls most of them don't want to talk to me i thought perhaps you didn't so i tried to keep out of your way oh sarah ermengarde almost wailed in her reproachful dismay and then after one more look they rushed into each other's arms it must be confessed that sarah's small black head lay for some minutes on the shoulder covered by the red shawl when ermengarde had seemed to desert her she had felt horribly lonely afterward they sat down upon the floor together sarah clasping her knees with her arms and ermengarde rolled up in her shawl ermengarde looked at the odd big-eyed little face adoringly i couldn't bear it any more she said i dare say you could live without me sarah but i couldn't live without you i was nearly dead so to-night when i was crying under the bedclothes i thought all at once of creeping up here and just begging you to let us be friends again you are nicer than i am said sarah i was too proud to try and make friends you see now that trials have come they have shown that i am not a nice child i was afraid they would perhaps that is what they were sent for i don't see any good in them said ermengarde stoutly neither do i to speak the truth admitted sarah frankly but i suppose there might be good in things even if we don't see it there might be good in miss minchin ermengarde looked round the attic with a rather fearsome curiosity sarah she said do you think you can bear living here sarah looked round also if i pretend it's quite different i can she answered or if i pretend it is a place in a story she spoke slowly her imagination was beginning to work for her it had not worked for her at all since her troubles had come upon her she had felt as if it had been stunned other people have lived in worse places think of the count of monte cristo in the dungeons of the chateau d'if and think of the people in the bastille the bastille half whispered ermengarde watching her and beginning to be fascinated she remembered stories of the french revolution which sarah had been able to fix in her mind by her dramatic relation of them no one but sarah could have done it a well-known glow came into sarah's eyes yes she said hugging her knees that will be a good place to pretend about i am a prisoner in the bastille i have been here for years and years and years and everybody has forgotten about me miss minchin is the jailer and becky a sudden light adding itself to the glow in her eyes becky is the prisoner in the next cell she turned to ermengarde looking quite like the old sarah i shall pretend that she said and it will be a great comfort ermengarde was at once enraptured and awed and will you tell me all about it she said may i creep up here at night whenever it is safe and hear the things you have made up in the day it will seem as if we are more best friends than ever Yes answered sarah nodding adversity tries people and mine has tried you and proved how nice you are end of chapter eight
of a little princess by francis hodgson burnett this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org chapter 9 of a little princess melchizedek the third person in the trio was lottie she was a small thing and did not know what adversity meant and was much bewildered by the alteration she saw in her young adopted mother she had heard it rumored that strange things had happened to sarah but she could not understand why she looked different why she wore an old black frock and came into the schoolroom only to teach instead of to sit in her place of honor and learn lessons herself there had been much whispering among the little ones when it had been discovered that sarah no longer lived in the rooms in which emily had so long sat in state lottie's chief difficulty was that sarah said so little when one asked her questions at seven mysteries must be made very clear if one is to understand them are you very poor now sarah she had asked confidentially the first morning her friend took charge of the small french class are you as poor as a beggar she thrust a fat hand into the slim one and opened round tearful eyes i don't want you to be poor as a beggar she looked as if she was going to cry and sarah hurriedly consoled her beggars have no way to live she said courageously i have a place to live in where do you live persisted lottie the new girl sleeps in your room and it isn't pretty any more i live in another room said sarah is it a nice one inquired lottie i want to go see it you must not talk said sarah miss minchin is looking at us she will be angry with me for letting you whisper she had found out already that she was to be held accountable for everything which was objected to if the children were not attentive if they talked if they were restless it was she who would be reproved but lottie was a determined little person if sarah would not tell her where she lived she would find out in some other way she talked to her small companions and hung about the elder girls and listened when they were gossiping and acting upon certain information they had unconsciously let drop she started late one afternoon on a voyage of discovery climbing stairs she had never known the existence of until she reached the attic floor there she found two doors near each other and opening one she saw her beloved sarah standing upon an old table and looking out of a window sarah she cried aghast mamma sarah she was aghast because the attic was so bare and ugly and seemed so far away from all the world her short legs had seemed to have been mounting hundreds of stairs sarah turned round at the sound of her voice it was her turn to be aghast what would happen now if lottie began to cry and any one chanced to hear they were both lost she jumped down from her table and ran to the child don't cry and make noise she implored i shall be scolded if you do and i have been scolded all day it's it's not such a bad room lottie isn't it gasped lottie and as she looked round it she bit her lip she was a spoiled child yet but she was fond enough of her adopted parent to make an effort to control herself for her sake then somehow it was quite possible that any place in which sarah lived might turn out to be nice why isn't it sarah she almost whispered sarah hugged her close and tried to laugh there was a sort of comfort in the warmth of the plump childish body she had had a hard day and had been staring out of the windows with hot eyes you can see all sorts of things you can't see downstairs she said what sort of things demanded lottie with that curiosity sarah could always awaken even in bigger girls chimneys quite close to us with smoke curling up in wreaths and clouds and going up into the sky and sparrows hopping about and talking to each other just as if they were people and other attic windows where heads may pop out any minute and you can wonder who they belong to and it all feels as high up as if it was another world oh let me see it cried lottie lift me up sarah lifted her up and they stood on the old table together and leaned on the edge of the flat window in the roof and looked out 
Anyone who has not done this does not know what a different world they saw. The slates spread out on either side of them, and slanted down into the rain-gutter pipes. The sparrows, being at home there, twittered and hopped about quite without fear. Two of them perched on the chimney-top nearest and quarrelled with each other fiercely, until one pecked the other and drove him away. The garret window next to theirs was shut, because the house next door was empty. "'I wish someone lived there,' Sarah said. "'It is so close that if there was a little girl in the attic, we could talk to each other through the windows, and climb over to see each other, if we were not afraid of falling.' The sky seemed so much nearer than when one saw it from the street that Lottie was enchanted. From the attic window, among the chimney-pots, the things which were happening in the world below seemed almost unreal. One scarcely believed in the existence of Miss Minchin and Miss Amelia and the schoolroom, and the roll of wheels in the square seemed a sound belonging to another existence. "'Oh, Sarah!' cried Lottie, cuddling in her guarding arm. "'I like this attic. I like it. It is nicer than downstairs.' "'Look at that sparrow.' whispered Sarah. I wish I had some crumbs to throw to him. I have some, came in a little shriek from Lottie. I have part of a bun in my pocket. I bought it with my penny yesterday, and I saved a bit. When they threw out a few crumbs, the sparrow jumped and flew away to an adjacent chimney-top. He was evidently not accustomed to intimates in attics, and unexpected crumbs startled him. But when Lottie remained quite still, and Sarah chirped very softly, almost as if she were a sparrow herself. He saw that the thing which had alarmed him represented hospitality after all. He put his head on one side, and from his perch on the chimney looked down at the crumbs with twinkling eyes. Lottie could scarcely keep still. "'Will he come? Will he come?' she whispered. "'His eyes look as if he would,' Sarah whispered back. "'He is thinking and thinking whether he dare." Yes, he will. Yes, he is coming. He flew down and hopped toward the crumbs, but stopped a few inches away from them, putting his head on one side again, as if reflecting on the chances that Sarah and Lottie might turn out to be big cats and jump on him. At last his heart told him they were really nicer than they looked, and he hopped nearer and nearer, darted at the biggest crumb with a lightning peck, seized it, and carried it away to the other side of his chimney. "'Now he knows,' said Sarah. "'And he will come back for the others.' He did come back, and even brought a friend, and the friend went away and brought a relative, and among them they made a hearty meal over which they twittered and chattered and exclaimed, stopping every now and then to put their heads on one side and examine Lottie and Sarah. Lottie was so delighted that she quite forgot her first shocked impression of the attic, in fact, when she was lifted down from the table and returned to earthly things, as it were, Sarah was able to point out to her many beauties in the room, which she herself would not have suspected the existence of. "'It is so little and so high above everything,' she said, "'that it is almost like a nest in a tree. The slanting ceiling is so funny. See, you can scarcely stand up at this end of the room, and when the morning begins to come, I can lie in bed and look right up into the sky through that flat window in the roof.' It is like a square patch of light. If the sun is going to shine, little pink clouds float about, and I feel as if I could touch them. And if it rains, the drops patter and patter as if they were saying something nice. Then, if there are stars, you can lie and try to count how many go into the patch. It takes such a lot. And just look at that tiny rusty grate in the corner. If it was polished and there was a fire in it, just think how nice it would be. You see, it's really a beautiful little room. She was walking round the small place holding Lottie's hand and making gestures which described all the beauties she was making herself see. She quite made Lottie see them, too. Lottie could always believe in the things Sarah made pictures of. "'You see,' she said, "'there could be a thick, soft blue Indian rug on the floor, and in that corner there could be a soft little sofa, with cushions to curl up on, and just over it could be a shelf full of books, so that one could reach them easily, and there could be a fur rug before the fire,' and hangings on the walls to cover up the whitewash, and pictures. They would have to be little ones, but they could be beautiful, and there could be a lamp with a deep rose-colored shade, and a table in the middle, with things to have tea with, and a little fat copper kettle singing on the hob, and the bed could be quite different. It could be made soft and covered with a lovely silk coverlet. It could be beautiful. 
and perhaps we could coax the sparrows until we made such friends with them that they would come and peck at the window and ask to be let in oh sarah cried lottie i should like to live here when sarah had persuaded her to go downstairs again and after setting her in her way had come back to her attic she stood in the middle of it and looked about her the enchantment of her imaginings for lottie had died away the bed was hard and covered with its dingy quilt the whitewashed wall showed its broken patches the floor was cold and bare the grate was broken and rusty and the battered footstool tilted sideways on its injured leg the only seat in the room she sat down on it for a few minutes and let her head drop in her hands the mere fact that lottie had come and gone away again made things seem a little worse just as perhaps prisoners feel a little more desolate after visitors come and go leaving them behind it's a lonely place she said sometimes it's the loneliest place in the world she was sitting in this way when her attention was attracted by a slight sound near her she lifted her head to see where it came from and if she had been a nervous child she would have left her seat on the battered footstool in a great hurry a large rat was sitting up on its hind quarters and sniffing the air in an interested manner some of lottie's crumbs had dropped upon the floor and their scent had drawn him out of his hole he looked so queer and so like a grey whiskered dwarf or gnome that sarah was rather fascinated he looked at her with his bright eyes as if he were asking a question he was evidently so doubtful that one of the child's queer thoughts came into her mind i dare say it is rather hard to be a rat she mused nobody likes you people jump and run away and scream out oh a horrid rat i shouldn't like people to scream and jump and say oh a horrid sarah the moment they saw me and set traps for me and pretend they were dinner it's so different to be a sparrow but nobody asked this rat if he wanted to be a rat when he was made nobody said wouldn't you rather be a sparrow she had sat so quietly that the rat had begun to take courage he was very much afraid of her but perhaps he had a heart like the sparrow and it told him that she was not a thing which pounced he was very hungry he had a wife and a large family in the wall and they had had frightfully bad luck for several days he had left the children crying bitterly and felt he would risk a good deal for a few crumbs so he cautiously dropped upon his feet come on said sarah i'm not a trap you can have them poor thing prisoners in the bastille used to make friends with rats suppose i make friends with you how it is that animals understand things i do not know but it is certain that they do understand perhaps there is a language which is not made of words and everything in the world understands it perhaps there is a soul hidden in everything and it can always speak without even making a sound to another soul but whatsoever was the reason the rat knew from that moment that he was safe even though he was a rat he knew that this young human being sitting on the red footstool would not jump up and terrify him with wild sharp noises or throw heavy objects at him which if they did not fall and crush him would send him limping in his scurry back to his hole he was really a very nice rat and did not mean the least harm when he had stood on his hind legs and sniffed the air with his bright eyes fixed on sarah he had hoped that she would understand this and would not begin by hating him as an enemy when the mysterious thing which speaks without saying any words told him that she would not he went softly toward the crumbs and began to eat them as he did it he glanced every now and then at sarah just as the sparrows had done and his expression was so very apologetic that it touched her heart she sat and watched him without making any movement one crumb was very much larger than the others in fact it could scarcely be called a crumb it was evident that he wanted that piece very much but it lay quite near the footstool and he was still rather timid i believe he wants to carry it to his family in the wall sarah thought if i do not stir at all perhaps he will come and get it she scarcely allowed herself to breathe she was so deeply interested the rat shuffled a little nearer and ate a few more crumbs then he stopped and sniffed delicately giving a side glance at the occupant of the footstool 
then he darted at the piece of bun with something very like the sudden boldness of the sparrow and the instant he had possession of it fled back to the wall slipped down a crack in the skirting board and was gone i knew he wanted it for his children said sarah i do believe i could make friends with him a week or so afterward on one of the rare nights when ermengarde found it safe to steal up to the attic when she tapped on the door with the tips of her fingers sarah did not come to her for two or three minutes there was indeed such a silence in the room at first that ermengarde wondered if she could have fallen asleep then to her surprise she heard her utter a little low laugh and speak coaxingly to some one there ermengarde heard her say take it and go home melchizedek go home to your wife almost immediately sarah opened the door and when she did so she found ermengarde standing with alarmed eyes upon the threshold who who are you talking to sarah she gasped out sarah drew her in cautiously but she looked as if something pleased and amused her you must promise not to be frightened not to scream the least bit or i can't tell you she answered ermengarde felt almost inclined to scream on the spot but managed to control herself she looked all round the attic and saw no one and yet sarah had certainly been speaking to some one she thought of ghosts is it something that will frighten me she asked timorously some people are afraid of them said sarah i was at first but i am not now was it a ghost quaked ermengarde no said sarah laughing it was my rat ermengarde made one bound and landed in the middle of the little dingy bed she tucked her feet under her nightgown and the red shawl she did not scream but she gasped with fright oh oh she cried under her breath a rat a rat i was afraid you would be frightened said sarah but you needn't be i am making him tame he actually knows me and come out when i call him are you too frightened to want to see him the truth was that as the days had gone on and with the aid of scraps brought up from the kitchen her curious friendship had developed she had gradually forgotten that the timid creature she was becoming familiar with was a mere rat at first ermengarde was too much alarmed to do anything but huddle in a heap upon the bed and tuck up her feet but the sight of sarah's composed little countenance and the story of melchizedek's first appearance began at last to rouse her curiosity and she leaned forward over the edge of the bed and watched sarah go and kneel down by the hole in the skirting board he he won't run out quickly and jump on the bed will he she said no answered sarah he's as polite as we are he's just like a person now watch she began to make a low whistling sound so low and coaxing that it could only have been heard in entire stillness she did it several times looking entirely absorbed in it ermengarde thought she looked as if she were working a spell and at last evidently in response to it a gray whiskered bright-eyed head peeped out of the hole sarah had some crumbs in her hand she dropped them and melchizedek came quietly forth and ate them a piece of larger size than the rest he took and carried in the most business-like manner back to his home ermengarde began to laugh oh sarah she said you are queer but you are nice i know i am queer admitted sarah cheerfully and i try to be nice she rubbed her forehead with her little brown paw and a puzzled tender look came into her face papa always laughed at me she said but i liked it he thought i was queer but he liked me to make up things i i can't help making up things if i didn't i don't believe i could live she paused and glanced round the attic i'm sure i couldn't live here she added in a low voice ermengarde was interested as she always was when you talk about things she said they seem as if they grew real you talk about melchizedek as if he was a person he is a person said sarah he gets hungry and frightened just as we do and he is married and has children how do we know he doesn't think things just as we do his eyes look as if he was a person that was why i gave him a name she sat down on the floor in her favorite attitude holding her knees besides she said he is a bastille rat sent to be my friend 
I can always get a bit of bread the cook has thrown away, and it is quite enough to support him. Is it the Bastille yet? asked Ermengarde eagerly. Do you always pretend it is the Bastille? Nearly always, answered Sarah. Sometimes I try to pretend it is another kind of place, but the Bastille is generally easiest, particularly when it is cold. Just at that moment Ermengarde almost jumped off the bed. She was so startled by a sound she heard. It was like two distinct knocks on the wall. What is that? she exclaimed. Sarah got up from the floor and answered quite dramatically. It is the prisoner in the next cell. Becky! cried Ermengarde, enraptured. Yes, said Sarah. Listen, the two knocks meant, Prisoner, are you there? She knocked three times on the wall herself, as if in answer. That means, yes, I am here and all is well. Four knocks came from Becky's side of the wall. That means, explained Sarah. Then, fellow sufferer, we will sleep in peace. Good night. Ermengarde quite beamed with delight. Oh, Sarah, she whispered joyfully. It is like a story. It is a story, said Sarah. Everything's a story. You are a story. I am a story. Miss Minchin is a story. And she sat down again and talked until Ermengarde forgot that she was a sort of escaped prisoner herself, and had to be reminded by Sarah that she could not remain in the Bastille all night, but must steal noiselessly downstairs again, and creep back into her deserted bed. End of chapter 9「Of a Little Princess by Frances Hodgson Burnett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 of A Little Princess, The Indian Gentleman. But it was a perilous thing for Ermengarde and Lottie to make pilgrimages to the attic. They could never be quite sure when Sarah would be there and they could scarcely ever be certain that Miss Amelia would not make a tour of inspection through the bedrooms after the pupils were supposed to be asleep. So their visits were rare ones, and Sarah lived a strange and lonely life. It was a lonelier life when she was downstairs than when she was in her attic. She had no one to talk to, and when she was sent out on errands and walked through the streets, a forlorn little figure carrying a basket or a parcel, trying to hold her hat on when the wind was blowing, and feeling the water soak through her shoes when it was raining. She felt as if the crowds hurrying past made her loneliness greater. When she had been the Princess Sarah, driving through the streets in her brougham, or walking, attended by Mariette, the sight of her bright, eager little face and picturesque coats and hats had often caused people to look after her. A happy, beautifully cared-for little girl naturally attracts attention. Shabby, poorly-dressed children are not rare enough and pretty enough to make people turn around to look at them and smile. No one looked at Sarah in these days, and no one seemed to see her as she hurried along the crowded pavements. She had begun to grow very fast, and, as she was dressed only in such clothes as the plainer remnants of her wardrobe would supply, she knew she looked very queer indeed. All her valuable garments had been disposed of, and such as had been left for her to use she was expected to wear so long as she could put them on at all. Sometimes, when she passed a shop window with a mirror in it, she almost laughed outright on catching a glimpse of herself, and sometimes her face went red and she bit her lip and turned away. In the evening, when she passed houses whose windows were lighted up, she used to look into the warm rooms and amuse herself by imagining things about the people she saw sitting before the fires or about the tables. It always interested her to catch glimpses of rooms before the shutters were closed. There were several families in the square in which Miss Minchin lived, with which she had become quite familiar in a way of her own. The one she liked best she called the large family. She called it the large family not because the members of it were big, for indeed most of them were little, but because there were so many of them. There were eight children in the large family, and a stout, rosy mother, and a stout, rosy father, and a stout, rosy grandmother, and any number of servants. 
the H children were always either being taken out to walk or to ride in perambulators by comfortable nurses, or they were going to drive with their mamma, or they were flying to the door in the evening to meet their papa and kiss him, and dance around him and drag off his overcoat, and look in the pockets for packages, or they were crowding about the nursery windows, and looking out and pushing each other and laughing. In fact, they were always doing something enjoyable and suited to the tastes of a large family. Sarah was quite fond of them, and had given them names out of books, quite romantic names. She called them the Montmorencys when she did not call them the large family. The fat, fair baby with a lace cap was Ethelberta Beauchamp Montmorency. The next baby was Violet Chelmondeley Montmorency. The little boy, who could just stagger and who had such round legs, was Sidney Cecil Vivian Montmorency, and then came Lillian Evangeline Maud Marion, Rosalind Gladys, Guy Clarence, Veronica Eustacia, and Claude Harold Hector. One evening a very funny thing happened, though perhaps in one sense it was not funny at all. Several of the Montmorencys were evidently going to a children's party, and just as Sarah was about to pass the door, they were crossing the pavement to get into the carriage which was waiting for them. Veronica Eustacia and Rosalind Gladys, in white lace frocks and lovely sashes, had just got in, and Guy Clarence, aged five, was following them. He was such a pretty fellow, and had such rosy cheeks and blue eyes, and such a darling little round head covered with curls, that Sarah forgot her basket and shabby cloak altogether, in fact forgot everything but that she wanted to look at him for a moment. So she paused and looked. It was Christmas time, and the large family had been hearing many stories about children, who were poor and had no mamas and papas, to fill their stockings and take them to the pantomime, children who were, in fact, cold and thinly clad and hungry. In the stories kind people, sometimes little boys and girls with tender hearts, invariably saw the poor children and gave them money or rich gifts, or took them home to beautiful dinners. Guy Clarence had been affected to tears that very afternoon by the reading of such a story, and he had burned with a desire to find such a poor child, and give her a certain sixpence he possessed and thus provide for her for life. An entire sixpence, he was sure, would mean affluence forevermore. As he crossed the strip of red carpet laid across the pavement from the door to the carriage, he had this very sixpence in the pocket of his very short man-o'-war trousers. And just as Rosalind Gladys got into the vehicle and jumped on to the seat in order to feel the cushion spring under her, he saw Sarah standing on the wet pavement in her shabby frock and hat, with her old basket on her arm, looking at him hungrily. He thought that her eyes looked hungry because she had perhaps had nothing to eat for a long time. He did not know that they looked so because she was hungry, for the warm, merry life his home held and his rosy face spoke of, and that she had a hungry wish to snatch him up in her arms and kiss him. He only knew that she had big eyes, and a thin face, and thin legs, and a common basket, and poor clothes. So he put his hand in his pocket, and found a sixpence, and walked up to her benignly. Here, poor little girl, he said, here is a sixpence. I will give it to you. Sarah started, and all at once realized that she looked exactly like poor children she had seen in her better days, waiting on the pavement to watch her as she got out of her brougham and she had given them pennies many a time. Her face went red, and then it went pale, and for a second she felt as if she could not take the dear little sixpence. Oh, no, she said. Oh, no, thank you. I mustn't take it indeed. Her voice was so unlike an ordinary street child's voice, and her manner was so like the manner of a well-bred little person, that Veronica Eustacia, whose real name was Janet, and Rosalind Gladys, who was really called Nora, leaned forward to listen. But Guy Clarence was not to be thwarted in his benevolence. He thrust the sixpence into her hand. Yes, you must take it, poor little girl, he insisted stoutly. You can buy things to eat with it. It is a whole sixpence. 
there was something so honest and kind in his face, and he looked so likely to be heartbrokenly disappointed if she did not take it, that Sarah knew she must not refuse him. To be as proud as that would be a cruel thing. So she actually put her pride in her pocket, though it must be admitted her cheeks burned. Thank you, she said. You are a kind, kind little darling, then. And as he scrambled joyfully into the carriage, she went away, trying to smile, though she caught her breath quickly and her eyes were shining through a mist. She had known that she looked odd and shabby, but until now she had not known that she might be taken for a beggar. As the large family's carriage drove away, the children inside it were talking with interested excitement. Oh, Donner! This was Guy Clarence's name. Janet exclaimed alarmedly. Why did you offer that little girl your sixpence? I'm sure she is not a beggar. She didn't speak like a beggar, cried Nora, and her face didn't really look like a beggar's face. Besides, she didn't back, said Janet. I was so afraid she might be angry with you, you know. It makes people angry to be taken for beggars when they are not beggars. She wasn't angry, said Donald, a trifle dismayed, but still firm. She laughed a little, and she said I was a kind, kind little darling thing. And I was stoutly it was my whole sixpence janet and nora exchanged glances a beggar girl would never have said that decided janet she would have said thank you kindly little gentleman thank you sir and perhaps she would have bought a courtesy sarah knew nothing about the fact but from that time the large family was as profoundly interested in her as she was in it faces used to appear at the nursery windows when she passed and many discussions concerning her were held round the fire. She is a kind of servant at the seminary, Janet said. I don't believe she belongs to anybody. I believe she is an orphan, but she is not a beggar, however shabby she looks. And afterward she was called by all of them, the little girl who is not a beggar, which was, of course, rather a long name, and sounded very funny sometimes when the youngest one said it in a hurry. Sarah managed to bore a little hole in the sixpence and hung it on an old bit of narrow ribbon round her neck. Her affection for the large family increased, as, indeed, her affection for everything she could love increased. She grew fonder and fonder of Becky, and she used to look forward to the two mornings a week when she went into the schoolroom to give their little ones their French lesson. Her small pupils loved her, and strove with each other for the privilege of standing close to her and insinuating their small hands into hers. It fed her hungry heart to feel them nestling up to her. She made such friends with the sparrows that when she stood upon the table, put her head and shoulders out of the attic window, and chirped, she heard almost immediately a flutter of wings and answering twitters, and a little flock of dingy town birds appeared, and alighted on the slates to talk to her, and make much of the crumbs she scattered. With Melchizedek she had become so intimate that he actually brought Mrs. Melchizedek with him sometimes, and now and then one or two of his children. She used to talk to him, and somehow he looked quite as if he understood. There had grown in her mind rather a strange feeling about Emily, who always sat and looked on at everything. It arose in one of her moments of great desolateness. She would have liked to believe, or pretend to believe, that Emily understood and sympathized with her. She did not like to own to herself that her only companion could feel and hear nothing. She used to put her in a chair sometimes, and sit opposite to her on the old red footstool, and stare, and pretend about her, until her own eyes would grow large with something which was almost like fear, particularly at night when everything was so still when the only sound in the attic was the occasional sudden scurry and squeak of Melchizedek's family in the wall. One of her pretends was that Emily was a kind of good witch who could protect her. Sometimes, after she had stared at her until she was wrought up to the highest pitch of fancifulness, she would ask her questions and find herself almost feeling as if she would presently answer. But she never did. As to answering, though, said Sarah, trying to console herself, I don't answer very often. I never answer when I can help it. When people are insulting you, there is nothing so good for them as not to say a word, just to look at them and think. 
Miss Minchin turns pale with rage when I do it. Miss Amelia looks frightened, and so do the girls. When you will not fly into a passion, people know you are stronger than they are, because you are strong enough to hold in your rage, and they are not, and they say stupid things they wish they hadn't said afterward. There's nothing so strong as rage, except what makes you hold it in. That's stronger. It's a good thing not to answer your enemies. I scarcely ever do. Perhaps Emily is more like me than I am like myself. Perhaps she would rather not answer her friends, even. She keeps it all in her heart. But though she tried to satisfy herself with these arguments, she did not find it easy. When, after a long, hard day, in which she had been sent here and there, sometimes on long errands through wind and cold and rain, she came in wet and hungry, and was sent out again because nobody chose to remember that she was only a child, and that her slim legs might be tired, and her small body might be chilled. When she had been given only harsh words and cold, slighting looks for thanks, when the cook had been vulgar and insolent, when Miss Minchin had been in her worst mood, and when she had seen the girls sneering among themselves at her shabbiness, then she was not always able to comfort her sore, proud, desolate heart with fancies when Emily merely sat upright in her old chair and stared. One of these nights, when she came up to the attic cold and hungry, with a tempest raging in her young breast, Emily's stare seemed so vacant, her sawdust legs and arms so inexpressive, that Sarah lost all control over herself. There was nobody but Emily, no one in the world, and there she sat. I shall die presently, she said at first. Emily simply stared. I can't bear this, said the poor child, trembling. I know I shall die. I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm starving to death. I've walked a thousand miles to-day, and they have done nothing but scold me from morning until night. And because I could not find that last thing the cook sent me for, they would not give me any supper. Some men laughed at me because my old shoes made me slip down in the mud. I'm covered with mud now, and they laughed. Do you hear? She looked at the staring glass eyes and complacent face, and suddenly a sort of heartbroken rage seized her. She lifted her little savage hand and knocked Emily off the chair, bursting into a passion of sobbing. Sarah, who never cried. You are nothing but a doll, she cried. Nothing but a doll. Doll, doll. You care for nothing. You are stuffed with sawdust. You never had a heart. Nothing could ever make you feel. You are a doll. Emily lay on the floor, with her legs ignominiously doubled up over her head, and a new flat place on the end of her nose. But she was calm, even dignified. Sarah hid her face in her arms. The rats in the wall began to fight and bite each other and squeak and scramble. Melchizedek was chastising some of his family. Sarah's sobs gradually quieted themselves. It was so unlike her to break down that she was surprised at herself. After a while she raised her face and looked at Emily, who seemed to be gazing at her round the side of one angle, and somehow, by this time actually with a kind of glassy-eyed sympathy, Sarah bent and picked her up. Remorse overtook her. She even smiled at herself, a very little smile. "'You can't help being a doll,' she said with a resigned sigh. "'Any more than Lavinia and Jessie can help not having any sense. We are not all made alike. Perhaps you do your sawdust best.' And she kissed her and shook her clothes straight, and put her back down upon her chair. She had wished very much that someone would take the empty house next door. She wished it because of the attic window which was so near hers. It seemed as if it would be so nice to see it propped open some day, and a head and shoulders rising out of the square aperture. If it looked a nice head, she thought, I might begin by saying, Good morning, and all sorts of things might happen. But, of course, it's not really likely that anyone but under-servants would sleep there. One morning, on turning the corner of the square after a visit to the grocers, the butchers, and the bakers, she saw, to her great delight, that during her rather prolonged absence, a van full of furniture had stopped before the next house, the front doors were thrown open, and men in shirt-sleeves were going in and out, carrying heavy packages and pieces of furniture. "'It's taken,' she said. "'It really is taken. Oh, I do hope a nice head will look out of the attic window.' She would almost have liked to join the group of loiterers who had stopped on the pavement to watch the things carried in. She had an idea that if she could see some of the furniture, she could guess something about the people it belonged to. Miss 
mentions tables and chairs are just like her she thought i remember thinking that the first minute i saw her even though i was so little i told papa afterward and he laughed and said it was true i am sure the lodge family have fat comfortable armchairs and sofas and i can see that their red flowery wallpaper is exactly like them it's warm and cheerful and kind-looking and happy she was sent out for parsley to the greengrocer's later in the day and when she came up the area steps her heart gave quite a quick beat of recognition several pieces of furniture had been set out of the van upon the pavement there was a beautiful table of elaborately wrought teak wood and some chairs and a screen covered with rich oriental embroidery the sight of them gave her a weird homesick feeling she had seen things so like them in india one of the things miss minchin had taken from her was a carved teak wood desk her father had sent her they are beautiful things she said they look as if they ought to belong to a nice person all the things look rather grand i suppose it is a rich family the vans of furniture came and were unloaded and gave place to others all the day several times it so happened that sarah had an opportunity of seeing things carried in it became plain that she had been right in guessing that the newcomers were people of large means all the furniture was rich and beautiful and a great deal of it was oriental wonderful rugs and draperies and ornaments were taken from the vans many pictures and books enough for a library among other things there was a superb god buddha in a splendid shrine someone in the family must have been in india sarah thought they have got used to indian things and like them i am glad i shall feel as if they were friends even if a head never looks out of the attic window when she was taking in the evening's milk for the cook there was really no odd job she was not called upon to do she saw something occur which made the situation more interesting than ever the handsome rosy man who was the father of the large family walked across the square in the most matter-of-fact manner and ran up the steps of the next-door house he ran up them as if he felt quite at home and expected to run up and down them many a time in the future he stayed inside quite a long time and several times came out and gave directions to the workmen as if he had a right to do so it was quite certain that he was in some intimate way connected with the newcomers and was acting for them if the new people have children sarah speculated the large family children will be sure to come and play with them and they might come up into the attic just for fun at night after her work was done becky came in to see her fellow prisoner and bring her news it's an indian gentleman that's comin to live next door miss she said i don't know whether he's a black gentleman or not but he's an indian one he's very rich and he's ill and the gentleman of the large family is his lawyer he's had a lot of trouble and it's made him ill and low in his mind he worships idols miss he's an even and bows down to wood and stone i seen an idol being carried in for him to worship somebody had oughter send him a track you can get a track for a penny sarah laughed a little i don't believe he worships that idol she said some people like to keep them to look at because they are interesting my papa had a beautiful one and he did not worship it but becky was rather inclined to prefer to believe that the new neighbor was an even it sounded so much more romantic than that he should merely be the ordinary kind of gentleman who went to church with a prayer book she sat and talked along that night of what he would be like of what his wife would be like if he had one and of what his children would be like if they had children sarah saw that privately she could not help hoping very much that they would all be black and would wear turbans and above all that like their parent they would be heathens i never lived next door to no heathens miss she said i should like to see what sort of ways they'd have it was several weeks before her curiosity was satisfied and then it was revealed that the new occupant had neither wife nor children he was a solitary man with no family at all and it was evident that he was shattered in health and unhappy in mind a carriage drove up one day and stopped before the house when the footman dismounted from the box and opened the door the gentleman who was the father of the large family got out first after him there descended a nurse in uniform then came down the steps two men-servants they came to assist their master who when he was helped out of the carriage proved to be a man with a haggard distressed face and a skeleton body wrapped in furs 
He was carried up the steps, and the head of the large family went with him, looking very anxious. Shortly afterward a doctor's carriage arrived, and the doctor went in, plainly to take care of him. There is such a yellow gentleman next door, Sarah, Lottie whispered at the French class afterward. Do you think he's a Chinese? The geography says the Chinese men are yellow. No, he is not Chinese, Sarah whispered back. He's very ill. Go on with your exercise, Lottie. No, monsieur. Je n'ai pas le canif de manque. That was the beginning of the story of the Indian gentleman. End of chapter 10